This is Toddophonic Todd, and I am here with Richard Thompson, legendary guitarist and songwriter with Fairport Convention, the duo with his wife, Linda, and a long and wonderful solo career. And he is the author of the new autobiography, along with Scott Timberg, B-Swing, Losing My Way and Finding My Voice, 1967 to 1975, published by Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill. Now, uh, Richard, perhaps surprisingly, one of the things that gives you fond memories of your youth in the 1950s are the areas in Britain that were actually bombed in World War II. That's true. Well, I, I suppose uh, if you're a kid, uh, you just see that as a, as a place to play. You know, there's, there's lots of uh, bits and pieces lying around, you, you know, um, you know, in some cases, old, old prams and dolls and, and uh, you know, just f fragments of people's lives. Uh, so... For us, it was uh, fun. Uh, it's probably really dangerous. You know, there's tons of broken yeah. glass everywhere. Yeah, you know, half collapsed staircases. I mean, if our parents knew what we got up to, my goodness me. <laughs> now, when you were growing up, music became perhaps the main thing to take you away from the drudgery, drudgery of school. In B-Swing, you write, my mind was like a sponge and every single style and facet of music was relevant. This included American and early British rock and roll that your sister Perry and her boyfriends were introducing you to, but also your father's jazz records and more. Yeah, uh, I just enjoyed listening to everything. Um, some things seem more important to the time. You know, you know, rock and roll seemed far more important than anything else. Uh, that seemed to be speaking much more for, you know, my sister's generation, my, my, my big sister generation. And even for me, even at the age of five, I, I thought it would this is my music, <laughs> strangely enough. <laughs> um, but everything else, I think, sunk in as well. Uh, certainly, I mean, I was listening to my dad's, um, you know, jazz records, French records he brought back from the war, you know, from the age of zero, really. So, so all that stuff really uh, permeated. And um, and then growing up in London, you had access to a lot of live music, uh, really great live music, from classical to jazz to to, to, to rock and roll. I mean, the, the whole spectrum, uh, lots of folk clubs. So uh, we really grew up listening to absolutely everything. Yeah, well, speaking of great live music, it would be easy for me to say in retrospect that I would have stayed for the Who's second Tuesday night set at the Marquee and walked home 10 miles. But you actually did it that, and on multiple occasions, I believe. I'm thinking that had to be a pretty special experience for you to be willing to do that. Uh it was very special, and I did it frequently. It was, it was so good. Um, yeah, you know, the Marquee Club had great uh, music um, most nights of the week. It, it started out as a jazz club back in the 50s, but the, then the rock and roll took over. And I think the Who started playing around about 65, 64, 65. Uh, they were there every Tuesday. They had the Yardbirds every Friday. Um, people like The Nice were on. Um, uh, Spencer Davis Group with, with Steve Winwood. Uh, so there was lots of great music. Um, so I would frequently, uh, on a school night, um, choose to miss the last train or bus and uh, walk home. And it, it was 10 miles, and it, it, it did take like two and a half hours to go home. Uh, and maybe that's the reason that my grades began to slip. <laughs> well, yeah, and at, at that time, you know, Britain really was the center of the universe. And I was surprised to see that one of your early band and schoolmates was you Cornwell, who of course later went on to the Stranglers. Yeah, um, yeah. Hugh and I uh, were, were just friends at school. Uh, you know, shared a lot, lot of common interests. Uh, one of which was music. And Hugh wanted to learn to play the bass, so um, I, I taught him bass. And, and then we had a little trio at school, uh, which was great fun. Yeah, just doing covers, really, sort of R and B covers, like everybody else in London at that time. And. Uh, when we left school, I really lost touch with him, and uh, I saw him um, about 40 years later <laughs> at a festival in Spain, and, and we sort of picked up where we left off, and, and uh, we're, we're in touch all the time now. Oh, that's great. Now, along with music at that stage in your life, painting was also very important to you as well, correct? Mm hmm Well, yeah, um, you know, I, I loved art. Um, and I thought maybe that was a career choice. Uh, music ne never seemed to be a career choice. It was always something that you did for fun. But at some point, uh, you'd better settle down and get a real job. And I thought, well, maybe uh, I could go into the art line to do graphic design or something. So um, 
uh, I did do a year um, apprenticing, if you like, to, to, to a graphic designer where we did uh, mosaic, stained glass, um, and uh, various other uh, things. And um, that was wonderful. I, I really love that. But uh, we, we, we were working so much as a band at that point that it, it became impractical to have a day job. So, so I, I really quit the day job for music, and, and I'm glad I did. Yeah, and going back to music, it would seem like, given your interest in so many different styles, uh, in terms of performing, that you came of musical age at the right time, the later 60s where experimentation was encouraged. In discussing the 14th hour Technicolor Dream concert at Alexandra Palace in April of 1967, you write, it was as if the shackles of pop music had been removed during the previous few months and a kind of musical anarchy had taken over. Mm, well, I did feel like that, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it was the beginning really of psychedelia in the UK, I suppose it had been there a little bit, sort of 66. But, uh, you know, just as you had in America, as you had in San Francisco, there, 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 there's this kind of, you know, uh, hippie thing happening. Um, and uh, it, it really was a kind of anarchy, I think. And and, and when Fairport started to, uh, to, to, pl to play a lot in 67, then um, uh, we really rode in on the wave of that. Uh, we, we were never a psychedelic band by the greatest stretch of the imagination, but uh, we, we uh, you know, we, we played alongside Pink Floyd um, and Soft Machine and uh, some of the other psychedelic bands, um, and it was just part of a movement, really. Um, but but it was great because there was lots of work. You know, we we were working six seven nights a week, which is fantastic, and uh, it was one of those times. I think you know, I think punk ten years later was, was similar. Where where a lot of people rode in on the wave, you, you know, with punk, you, know, you had the Pretenders or Elvis Costello, who I, I don't really think of as punk, Squeeze, you know, definitely won a punk right. band. Um, so uh, Fairport kind of took advantage of that, really, and uh, we found that we had an audience um, uh, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And in addition to your contemporaries in London, the American West Coast musical scene had great appeal to Fairport Convention. Your early repertoire consisted of numbers from the likes of Love, The Birds, and The Merry-Go-Round. And The Move and other UK acts were also thrilled by the same sounds. Why do you think these uh, American West Coast bands translated so well to musicians overseas? I think for us, it was um, it was the lyrics, you know, the, the fact that uh, these bands um, were, you know, that band like The Birds were, were adapting, you know, Pete Seeger songs were adapting traditional songs. Uh, with great lyrics, uh, and and we're the first people really to sing sing Bob Dylan songs uh, in a rock in a rock and roll context, um, and that really changed everything in popular music. Uh, the fact that you could suddenly have responsible adult lyrics in what was pre previously considered to be uh, sort of like like teenage music, really. So um, you know, Fairport loved uh, covering songs by like people like Phil Oaks, Richard Farina, uh, Dylan, uh, Leonard Cohen. Um, you know, uh, we, we, we loved all the all all the 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 uh, the, the great singer songwriters at that time, and uh, that, that was just our own particular area um, of enjoyment, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And another act that was popular in America but seemed to be much more influential in Britain would be the band. Yeah, uh, yeah. Strangely, I suppose not that popular in the states in real terms. Um, I think the band had a huge influence. Uh, the, the first couple of band albums um, were massively influential on, on British musicians at that time. Um, and uh, for Fairport, it was a watershed, really, because we thought, well, this is so perfect. Um, the, the, these guys have encapsulated all these uh, American roots stars. I mean, it's all in there. You, you know, rock's in there, jazz is in there, gospel, country. Uh, everything is in there and in a kind of seamless way. And they're writing these great contemporary songs that, that are built on that tradition. So we should be writing songs built on our tradition, um, coming from, you know, England, Ireland, Scotland. Uh, we, we should be playing much more of our own traditional music uh, and, and playing it in a contemporary, more of a rock style with, with amplifiers and drums. And uh, a key player on the British scene in the late 60s and extremely influential in terms of both Fairport and later on with your own career was Joe Boyd. Yeah, uh, Joe um, 
was an American. Uh, he, he'd had a, a very uh, interesting life up to that point. I mean, he, he when we met him, he was like 25 years old, but but he'd already, um, when he was at Harvard, he booked, um, you know, some people like Lonnie Johnson, you know, who was at that point probably washing dishes. I mean, he, he found these people for, for, from the South and, and and brought them up and 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 put them in, in, in concert in, uh, in Boston. And um, he was the stage manager when um, uh, Dylan went to Electric at uh, Newport Folk Festival when, when there was like a riot. And he came to Britain as uh, the head of um, Electra Records in, in the UK. And, uh, you know, he, he tried to convince them to sign Pink Floyd and they weren't interested. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and to sign The Move, you know, who were a fantastic band at that time. Um, so he got frustrated with, with that. And, and then he became just an independent record producer. And he produced the incredible string band. Um, and uh, then he signed Fairport and, and then he went on to, to produce Nick Drake, who, who's now a uh, very revered uh, John Martin, someone else who's, uh, whose reputation has, has grown over the years. Uh, so Joe was in, in, in many ways like the one guy in Britain who had ears, um, who understood what Fairport were trying to do, understood the roots of, of our music. Um, so we were very lucky to run into Joe. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judy Dybul was the first female vocalist in Fairport, but her voice wasn't quite strong enough to sing over the band. In May of 68, Sandy Denny joined the group and took you to the next level. You write mm -hmm. that, quote unquote, the longing in Sandy's voice brought an elusive quality to our music. Unfortunately for Sandy, would it be fair to say that longing was never fulfilled in her life? Well, I, I think Sandy was an emotional human being, um, and that definitely translated in, into the way she sang. I, I mean, I mean, she had an extraordinary voice, and I don't think it, it's comparable to anybody else. Um, so it was a kind of unique quality that she had. Uh, Sandy, you know, you know, died age thirty-one. Um, you know, she she kind of deteriorated into sort of drink and drugs. Um, uh, so the, the end was rather sad, but she was, a, you know, a wonderful human being at the time that I knew her well, and was lots of fun. You know, it was very funny um, and a fantastic musician. I mean, a wonderful songwriter and just a phenomenally good singer. Mm -hmm. The late '60s and early '70s saw an incredible influx of music festivals, especially in Europe. Fairport Convention played at a lot of them. Do you think that help you? achieve at least a somewhat larger audience for the band it's always good to be booked on festivals because um you'd reach out to a different audience um not necessarily a larger audience but a bit different so uh people would be there to see perhaps their favorite act and, and they might catch you and think oh okay that's good um uh when we toured in the states in 1970 um we we felt that our real target audience was at the philadelphia folk festival where we absolutely stormed it. I mean, we had just a most wonderful reaction. Um, and that felt like like coming home, really. That, that was just absolutely great. So, uh, yeah, festivals in those days, I mean, we, we played some big ones where we played, you know, some 100,000 sized um, festivals um, in Europe, for sure. Um, and, uh, well, festivals haven't gone away, have they? They're, they're still going, uh, <laughs> still very popular. Hopefully we'll, we'll all get back out there um, Maybe this summer or next summer. Uh, I, I've got a, I've got a few uh, coming up this summer uh, in the states and in Europe. So that's that's a good sign. Great. Now, at a certain point with Fairport, you realized you needed to create your own identity. You felt that playing Sandy's arrangements of traditional songs in conjunction with original material that you wrote fitted into the musical Neverland between rock and traditional music might bring you salvation. Now, hmm. that that was based more on what your aesthetic needs were at the time that, than commercial instinct, correct? Commercial instinct was never a big, big thing with Fairport. Uh, we always put uh, the idealism first. We we're a very idealistic, you know, thoughtful band about the kind of music that we wanted to play. And so um, we saw that particular direction uh, as being very valid and uh, and much needed to revive um, the traditional music of the, of the British Isles um, and, and bring it to a new audience or bring it to a contemporary audience. So that was absolutely uh, a, a deliberate, thoughtful step. 
Yes, and you opine that striking a balance between modern and traditional was a challenge. How were you able to rise to that challenge? Uh, I think some things work and some things don't work, and you develop an instinct for 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 which is which. Um, I, I think uh, th there are things that I think are, are too bucolic, if you like, for for uh, for uh, you know rock music, uh, too too rural, too, too countryfied. Uh, in some cases, some of the older songs um, lose their meaning uh, over time. Other songs uh, remain absolutely valid and, and up to date. Uh, so you really just have to pick and choose, I think, uh, as to what works and what doesn't. You write about a, uh, a the tragic van accident that occurred in 1969, which took the life of your drummer, Martin Lamble, and your then girlfriend, Jeannie. And the band decided to carry on, but not to rely on the material that you had played with Martin. That seems like a very difficult and mature decision to have made from, to be made by people so young. I, th I think you were just in your early twenties at the time. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the accident, um, aged us very, very rapidly. I think, uh, to have that, that kind of, uh, encounter with death at, at that age, um, makes you become, uh, mature, uh, all of a sudden you, you grow up very quickly. Uh, I, I think we really couldn't go back to playing the old repertoire. Um, and so we drew a line, uh, and, uh, started afresh, you know, we rehearsed for a few months and then, uh, went out on the road with, with the new repertoire. I mean, perhaps some of our old fans were disappointed that, that we weren't playing the old stuff, but uh, for us, it was just an impossibility at that time. Mm -hmm. And the band ultimately made it to America where you rub shoulders in various ways with the likes of Phil Oaks, Linda Ronstadt, Led Zeppelin, and Buck Owens, uh, among others. And it sounds like you had some good experiences here, such as the Philadelphia Folk Festival that you mentioned, but the band, uh, it's also fair to say that, you know, the band never really, quote unquote, caught on here. Do you think what you were trying to do musically was too much of a culture shock for audiences in the States? I think it was, yeah. Um, you have to remember that the most uh, uh, British bands going back to the States, you know, the, the, um, the, you know, the British invasion, uh, were kind of uh, recycling some American music styles uh, back at America, um, particularly taking stuff from the South and 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 changing it a little bit and and and, and taking it back and playing it in in the North, um, where it wasn't that well known. I mean, I, you know, Northern Northern Americans that did weren't aware of of the Southern states music as as well as they might have been. So. Uh, you know the Beatles, the Stones, the, the Kinks, the Searchers. I mean, the, you know that whole generation um, were really playing American music uh, with a slight British twist. So Fairport was something really different, and um, I think uh, it didn't immediately catch on. I mean, it's a bit like like something like reggae. You know, um, it's it's a bit like like you know Bob Marley and the Wailers uh, suddenly turning up in America and playing, and, and people might scratch their heads and say. You know, this this sounds kind of alien, and perhaps it takes a few years to get used to it. Right, and uh, you became somewhat musically disillusioned with Fairport in, in large part due to s some of the tempos that were being played, especially with the uh, David Swarbrick on fiddle. And you decided the best thing for you to do was leave the band. Uh, when you did that, you didn't really have much of a plan at that point, correct? No, I didn't. Um, I think, uh, you know, bands uh, can have a, a finite life. And, and I think uh, if a band sticks together for, for five years, um, you're doing well, you know, 10 years is a miracle. Um, because, you know, egos come into play, people get dissatisfied, people, people get um, restless. Um, and I think I was just burned out from being in bands since about the age of 12. Uh, and I just wanted to see what would happen. If I did a solo record, if if I if I wrote some songs on my own, uh, away from other people's influence, um, and so uh, you know, I I didn't really know what I was going to do. I mean, as it turns out, um, I, I did a lot of session guitar work um, in in 1971, 72, uh, which was great because uh, that, that was a means of uh, of support of survival. So, so I did, I just did tons of studio work. 
and I was on the road with uh, San Sandy and Sandy's band, uh, Ian Matthews' band. So um, I was never unemployed, which was very handy. I am talking to Richard Thompson, author of the autobiography B Swing, published by Algonquin Books. Now, at that time, Richard, you employed a genius strategy, uh, quoting from the book again. I wanted to be successful, but if I wasn't, I could find perverse comfort in that. I could say the music was too good for the masses and have something to complain about. That That's kind of like a win-win situation. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think again, uh, we were kind of musical snobs in Fairport. We really were. And um, we really saw success out on our own terms. Um, we didn't care that much for commercial success. If it came, great. If it didn't, well, we could just, uh, you know, as, as I say, you know, find sort of perverse comfort in that. Uh, uh, so a very, um, very snobby attitude. You started dating Linda Peters in 1971, I guess they were shortly after leaving Fairport. And uh, part of the reason the two of you actually began performing together was that it was so that you wouldn't be apart as much. Uh, some of your most loved songs, such as the title track from I Want to See the Bright Lights Tonight and Wall of Death, date from this period with Linda. Hmm. Well, I think it was a, a fertile period uh, in many ways. I mean, well, we had a lot of fun working together. Um, I, I think as a duo, uh, it was very successful. Um, and that particular album, I, I think, worked really, really well. Um, and I still think it's a good record. I, I think it, it's uh, it's a lucky record. Uh, sometimes you go in the studio, everything works right away. Um, you know, you, you whiz through the recording process. I mean, I mean we made that album in just a few days. Um, for a very small amount of money and uh everything just fit together um very very, very fortunately mm -hmm. uh not all records are like that <laughs> <laughs> no uh if you and linda had a difficult gig did you bring that home with you i think that's one of the hard things about being in a, a in a musical uh, entity with your um you know spouse uh, other half whatever um because sometimes there's no one to complain to um and uh i think that that's, that's actually the hardest thing it, it, I, I i think when we had time off we, we would say well uh, you know I'm, I'm gonna go out with my friends you go out with your friends and uh we'll get some space from each other because it really can get claustrophobic and you note in b swing that as you're making these records with linda that rock is getting bigger and more elaborate, you know, prog rock and, and the who at this point kind of trying to perfect stadium rock and that your brand of music is getting pushed even further to the background. What what made you persevere? Uh, I think at a certain point I didn't persevere. I mean, but by the end of the book, I'm not persevering at all. Uh, well, I mean, I, I sort of self-belief, really, um, you know, love of what you're doing. You know, you have, you have to love music to, to play it really properly. Um, so it's just enjoying the process uh, until it's seen that the audience had frittered away somewhat and uh, we were being replaced by punk, uh, by and large. So, so punk was this double-edged sword, really, because, um, you know, I, I loved it and I saw it as an antidote to... The pomposity of rock at that point which was all you know, you know it was like glam rock prog rock metal you know very overblown um pretentious stuff uh to some extent and here were you know the sex pistols and the clash uh, getting back to basics and i thought whether well, that's the way to go that's the way rock music should be it, it should be basic you know you know three minutes guitar bass drums go for it <clears throat> so so for me it was a kind of a, an eye-opening moment i thought well, well this is this will get me back uh and give me a renewed focus on the music that i want to play yeah we played a tear-stained letter to start the show today with that great lyric about uh your heart beating fast like a song from the clash um, ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now in in the mid 70s you converted to islam via your devotion to uh sufism and among other things, you gave up alcohol. Uh, you recently mentioned that you don't believe you ever went on stage sober with Fairport. How much of an impact did that decision have on your life? Well, I had a big decision. Uh, but then again, I mean, I don't think I changed very much. Uh, I, th I think I always was the person I am today. Uh, I just didn't quite have the, uh, the, the, the direction and the focus. So, uh, you know, quit, quitting drinking. Um, 
wasn't a problem. I mean, I, I think I, I think I drank to numb myself, you know, to, to numb that kind of hollow place uh, inside me. And uh, when I got spiritually fulfilled, then I didn't need to do that anymore. And it was as simple as that. And I, I one day I, I stopped drinking and, you know, no withdrawal symptoms, anything. I, I just stopped and, and, I, and, 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 and got on with the rest of my life. Now, uh, at various points in B-Swing, you write about your difficult relationship with your father. The last we hear about in the book is when you were in your 20s. Did that relationship ever improve? I don't think it ever really did. Uh, I think he tried uh, at various points to, uh, to to reach out to me, and, and um, I, I, just, I just found the relationship was so damaged that, that I, I, I could hardly go there. I mean, you know, we, we were civil with each other, but I don't think it was a warm, close relationship, but by any means. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm so, I mean, he passed away a, a good while ago and, um, and I regret the fact, of course, that uh, we weren't able to get be, to get to be closer. Now, uh, in addition to songwriting and, and other things, you're of course also known for your guitar playing and you make note of numerous guitar purchases in the book. And uh, rather than ask if, if you have a favorite, do you think there's guitar you might be able to say was most meaningful to you? I think I, yeah, guitars are tools. Uh, I don't have a particular, you know, love relationship with any particular guitar. I mean, I, you know, I, I play a Fender on stage these days uh, when I'm with a band, uh, and that's a great guitar, and I love it. And I'm probably more addicted to Fenders than anything else right now. But but I'm happy to pick up a different guitar in a studio or even on stage and and, and play that. Um, you know, uh, uh, horses for courses. Uh, some guitars are good for some things. Some are good for other things. Uh, acoustically, uh, I play the uh, Loudon guitars, which I think are absolutely great. And um, they are really uh, my, my favorite guitar for, for stage and studio. Um, but that doesn't mean I, I can't pick up an old Martin and enjoy playing it. So, uh, you know, they're, they're absolutely tools of the trade. And if you have that attitude, then, then when one gets broken or stolen, it, it doesn't break your heart and, uh, and you don't have to go to pieces. Uh, I'm curious to know if you learned a lot about yourself by writing B Swing. I think it was interesting to have to to go back um, and talk about all this stuff. Um, some stuff uh, was quite painful, so I don't always look at it, you know. Um, uh, and and I think maybe there are a few things that I didn't ever deal with, so that was good in a way to uh, to bring it out and, and kind of look at it and and then put it to bed a bit more safely if you like so um yeah i think it was it was a cathartic experience for me in some cases and of course the more you think about stuff about old stuff uh the more you remember so it, it opened up a few a few a few doors in the memory right uh going back to music for a moment one thing that i think to me has made you such a special and enduring artist is that uh, you have incorporated more influence in, in your music over time, uh, starting at the beginning of your career, but you haven't really subtracted any, which is something I think a lot of musicians do. I um, mm -hmm. Focusing on a time when, when you were doing a show at my old club, Maxwell's, and I came down to our spacious dressing room to, uh, <laughs> to bring you up, and, and you were in the dressing room by yourself uh, playing Cliff Gallup guitar riffs and singing Gene Vincent's Gonna Back Up Baby, and I was just you know, I was kind of uh, just blown away in in, in a way. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I, I might play in the dressing room. I'm not sure I, I play on stage. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Gene Vincent was just an absolute um, idol for me. I mean, just a, such a great performer, such a, a great band as well. I mean, they made some of the greatest rock and roll records. Um, and for me, one of the biggest thrills of being on uh, on Capitol Records was being able to record in Capitol Studio B, where they made records like Bebop Alula, you know, with Gene Vincent. So, you know, th that sound is just just kills me. Wonderful. And uh, before we part company today, Richard, I have to ask you about one thing uh, not addressed in B-Swing as it's more recent. But how did you wind up living in the great state of New Jersey? <laughs> uh, a woman. <laughs> Chercher la femme. Um, yeah, yeah, um, my, my, my partner lives in New Jersey, so I, it was easier for me to move to her than for her to move to me. So, so uh, that's the reason I'm, I'm there. I'm in Montclair, New Jersey, very 
pleasant suburb. Um, and it's a great state. I mean, uh, it's a state of, of serious contrast, but uh, there's really beautiful parts of it. Yeah. Well, Richard, thanks so much for appearing on the show today. Best of luck with B Swing, and I can't wait to see you on a stage again soon. Let's hope so. Let's hope it's soon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care.